on the education committee. So we need to have a hearing and we need to work the bill. We have 10 votes and it goes to the floor of the house. So the, the uh, chairman's uh, position on that is we're just not going to hear or work the bill, period. And uh, uh, I talked to him on two or three occasions and said, you know, this is not the way people are expecting our system to work in Topeka. You're supposed to hear bills, you're supposed to work bills, and things that the committee decides on are the, the things that should be coming to the floor of the House. And we're here to represent the people of Kansas, not the, not the Republican leadership sitting up there in the leadership chairs. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that uh, uh, we have the strong committee system working in Topeka, and uh, uh, those chairmen can just uh, 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 basically say, no, we're not going to work anything, and, and that's basically what we've been doing in, uh, in education. It did work to our favor this week because he did have an interest in a, uh, uh, a religious freedom bill. That, uh, and I've noticed in Topeka, if, if a bill says either religion, freedom, or family, it's probably a bad bill. And uh, uh, anyway, this bill was, was something that he seemed to be actually interested in. And they were pointing out in this, when we were discussing this bill, that uh, there were several examples of teachers that were concerned about their jobs uh, if they didn't follow along with the uh, policies and so on that uh, that uh, school districts wanted or individuals might want that district and so on. And so I said, <clears throat> said I raised my hand and said, well, you know, this this sounds like a perfect bill to amend uh, uh, due process on to because, uh, uh, you know, we can't have these teachers out there worried about their jobs based on this on this issue. And um, so that effectively killed that bill right there, even if it passes out of committee. It'll never see the light of day on the floor because they know it's amendable to due process. So uh, it was kind of it was kind of nice to get a uh, a little gotcha back on uh, on that bill. But uh, we still got uh, uh, there won't be much coming out of there. We did uh, uh, Reed was talking about uh, the bill for uh, uh, mandatory financial uh, literacy uh, requirements and uh, uh, those sorts of things just aren't going anywhere this year. And then on the, uh, my final bill, or my final uh, committee is on taxation, and that's gonna get real interesting real quick. <clears throat> We've been working uh, Senate Bill 22 in there for the last couple, three days, and we'll be doing it again on uh, Monday, and this is uh, Senator Wangel's bill, uh, that is a terrible bill. Uh, basically returns kind of a brownback two type of bill, and uh, they're talking about the windfall that, uh, that the state of Kansas is getting and needs to be returned to uh, uh, big corporations and wealthy individuals. Well, they're, make, they're making it sound like the, uh, the feds are sending us a check for $155 million or so. That's not the case. They're just not charging these companies and so on. Uh, they've reduced the, uh, the tax rate from, I believe, 37% to 21%, so it makes it uh, more attractive for these companies to bring back uh, money that they've been basically hiding offshore for a long time. And now they're getting that money back and now they don't want to pay any state sales tax on that on that money. And uh, so we're going to be <clears throat> deep in the, uh, in the weeds on that issue over the next uh, couple of weeks, I'm sure. And uh, I'm very much in favor of, uh, of taxing those folks. They're the ones that got the big benefits off the LLC plan that Brownback uh, had in place and almost wrecked the economy of our state. So uh, uh, stay tuned on that one, that's gonna be interesting. We're also talking about internet sales taxes on that. And uh, uh, I'm all for uh, taxing internet sales. Basically, we do it on 80% of the, of the uh, uh, things that we buy on the internet right now. We're looking at basically the other 20%. And right now, most people I don't think even realize that uh, if you buy something on the internet and you don't pay sales tax on it, you're supposed to keep that and itemize it in your tax return at the end of the year and then pay your sales tax at that at that time of the year. So uh, this would this would just simplify a lot of things and would also help our local stores uh, that have to charge sales tax and puts them in, at a real uh, financial disadvantage when they have to compete against internet sales. So that will be a, a uh, interesting discussion I think and I'm just looking to see what else uh, Representative Curtis, who happens to be my uh, office mate up there, uh, she and I for the last year have been working on, on a way to increase funding for the uh, arts in Kansas. 
And uh, that was one of the first thing that, that uh, Brownback did when he came into office was get rid of the Kansas Arts Commission. And I guarantee you, uh, high tech companies, that sort of thing, any kind of companies, when they're looking to relocate someplace, the arts and cultural environment in that community or in that state is high on your list as far as things they look for when they uh, uh, make their decisions on whether to grow a company here or move a company here, that sort of thing. So we need to uh, uh, get more emphasis on that. Uh, we, uh, Pam and I got uh, uh, through the house at least so far a $300,000 increase in their funding from about 188000 to 500000 That's way too low. Uh, believe it or not, the arts and cultural community in Kansas is a big, big industry. And it is the third uh, largest private employer in the KC Metro. And we're putting basically next to nothing into supporting that industry. So we're going to be looking for ways to continue that and we're going to uh, uh, be looking for ways to really make a move on that next year. So uh, anyway, that's kind of what's happening in my committees and uh, uh, hopefully we'll, uh, if you have any questions about any of those sorts of things, we'll uh, catch up on that in the questions and answers. Thank you. Good morning, good rainy morning. Uh, I'm Dave Benson. I represent House District 48, which is between Metcalf and Slicer, 151st to 119th, more or less. Uh, Ray, I, I want to uh, tell you that going last uh, has its advantages. I agree with everything they said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, being first in the alphabet has its disadvantages, I, as I found out in basic training in the United States Army. Um, I had KP the first week, and then they run the KP roster again on weekends. A different roster, so I had KP two times in the first week because of a B. So, and they never got to the end of the alphabet. <laughs> uh, Monday, as I understand, it's the last day of committees, and we'll be going to the floor of the war. Uh, I uh, have the privilege of being a, a 68 year old freshman, so I'm uh, learning uh, new things. And what I've learned is we're going to turn the corner from a lot of committee work, more to uh, work on the floor, uh, starting this week. And so we'll uh, uh, do a little more. So far, the floor work has been a series of bills that have been almost every one of them unanimous, uh, no-brainer kind of stuff that's, that's coming through. I serve on three committees, financial institutions and pensions. We did do a cleanup and modernization of the savings and loan uh, statutes this year. And I believe that went ahead and passed the House unanimously. We're, we're sending that on over, so uh, that was a, a good thing to do. We've talked a lot about CAPERS and different groups and how different groups interplay with different groups. Uh, and I want to let you know two things about CAPERS, uh, not necessarily related to the committee, but are important uh, issues. One is the Democrats uh, unanimously supported uh, ways in which we could have a cost of living adjustment for our CAPERS retirees. Uh, I had the privilege of carrying one of those uh, amendments on the floor. Uh, my particular amendment would have given a 2.5% uh, COLA to every Capers employee uh, the, uh, on their 10th anniversary and a 5% raise on their 20th anniversary. Uh, uh, that was voted down on a pretty much a straight partisan vote, as far as uh, I could tell, looking at the board. Um, so your Democratic representatives across the state are the people who are speaking out for our long-term retirees that have been uh, frozen uh, in their retirement for decades. And the second CAPERS issue, uh, a bill came to us this week from the Senate to repay a loan uh, to CAPERS that was taken out uh, by the previous administration. 
and all of a sudden our uh, Republican colleagues had found a conscience and thought that perhaps stealing money from retirees is not a good idea. And so we uh, uh, pretty much unanimously paid back $115 million to the Capers Fund, uh, and that should help its actuarial uh, situation. Uh, and everybody was in support of that. Uh, I don't speak for the governor, but I would anticipate she'll, she'll sign that bill. I'm also on uh, education. I uh, concur our chair is not interested in pro any progressive ed education legislation. We have some uh, regressive uh, measures that we've been talking to. And I gotta tell you, as a 33-year veteran superintendent, 44-year veteran educator, I get my blood boiling a little bit, and <clears throat> as I can tell you, I'm not, well, let's put this right, I'm pretty direct uh, in conferees, and uh, uh, we've tackled really no issues that uh, uh, I believe merit getting out of, uh, to the floor. I am a signatory to the, uh, the due process bill. I believe in my experience that having due process for educators and other employees through our labor contracts uh, was a good thing. It kept administration and boards uh, honest and on their toes and doing their jobs, my job, uh, in a proper way uh, in our labor management relations. So I uh, support uh, reinstatement of due process. I'm on the transportation and public safety budget. I have to tell you that's been a very interesting committee uh, learning process. On almost, well now, I don't to correct that, on every public safety budget hearing we had, it is abundantly clear that over the last administration, we have gotten completely out of whack with our uh, salary relationships with our employees in relationship to what other states are doing, in relationship to what counties are doing and what cities are doing, and our state system needs help on keeping retaining and paying a good living wage to our very valuable state employees. And what has happened over the last eight years is a travesty. On transportation, uh, we approved the governor's budget plus $6 million. Uh, $6 million was the amount of money necessary to scoop up one more of the T-Works projects that have been delayed. And we have three years of delayed projects to go through before we can start addressing things like 69 Highway, <laughs> running north and south through Johnson County. Uh, very important project for our local economic development, our local growth. Uh, so we, we added $6 million there, and that scoops up a project actually down uh, in southeast Kansas in Montgomery County, but it checks off one more project. And we also uh, made a recommendation to appropriations to have a reconsideration of $50 million uh, should that money be available at the end of the session uh, that would uh, be recommended to go into transportation. And as the governor has said, we want to close the bank of KDOT and get that money back to its original purpose. Um, I would encourage you to, uh, to contact me if you have ideas regarding legislation. I had a forum last Saturday and uh, one of the individuals there had an idea around uh, uh, election law uh, and uh, uh, having National election being a state holiday, uh, except obviously for election workers. Uh, 
But uh, uh, so I've picked that up and been to the revisor. Uh, and if we ever get an elections bill that I could tag it on to, I'm going to try to tag that on as a minute and see if we can't run that uh, idea. Once every four years, it's not going to kill the state to have an additional holiday for our uh, valuable state workers to allow them to uh, vote uh, and participate in the democracy and I have to stand in long lines, but moreover to be available as election workers. I don't know if any of you work the polls, but uh, it's uh, uh, a struggle sometimes for our county election officials to find poll workers and if they have a ready pool of uh, highly motivated, trained people, that would uh, be an additional group. Uh, sports betting, internet sales tax, medical marijuana, those are all issues that we need to uh, tackle and uh, I look forward to your questions. Uh, it's mine. I can break it. It's fine. Uh, I guess I'll hold on to this. So uh, we do have a few questions from the audience. We'll get started with that. And uh, uh, Jared, I'm going to presume you want to take the first one, which is uh, what's going on with the Department of Children and Family Services? You know, I can't speak for um, internal department uh, issues, but I can say that we've got a new staff. I've sat down in the conference room at the, at the DCF uh, headquarters and I had I think the deputy secretary who happens to be a Johnson County native and um, their new policy director, their new legislative liaison and the new special uh, assistant to the secretary and we've had good conversations about where we're going, where we need to go and I think that they uh, are putting their priorities together and I think one of their main priorities A is that FFPSA like I discussed but then also uh, repealing the lifetime limitations on uh, temporary assistance for needy families. Um, if, if you guys recall a couple of years ago, the Kansas legislature took us from the federally eligible 60 months in a lifetime down to 24 months in a lifetime. And that was not only for the cash assistance, which is TANF, but for um, supplemental nutrition assistance program, which is our food stamps, as well as um, child care, uh, child care assistance. So it was across the board um, and as those services and assistance started declining, um, enrollment in foster care, uh, children coming into state custody, I, I refuse to use state care because I, I don't believe we've been giving them the care that they need there in state custody and, uh, and, I, and I'm hoping that that's going to change and, and I think that's the department's uh, uh, priority right now, and again, I can't speak for them, but this is the gist that I get from them, is they want to focus upon preventing any more kids from getting in while focusing upon better care for the kids that are in, and I would fall back to their contract renegotiations upon that and getting proper people in place with the best qualifications to provide the best services that we can. So I think everybody now has the best interest of the child in, in mind, and we're, we're going to work together, but again, it's a big ship. DCF, uh, one of, one of the other priorities that has to occur within the department is an upgrade to their uh, computer system. They are still operating just outside of the shoebox. I say that all the time. It's, uh, and, and, and they have data on our most vulnerable population in there, and they need to be able to communicate that with law enforcement, with KDEGS, with KDHE, because it's a complicated system. And when you get these kids into the can care and, and the medical services and the behavioral health services that they need, that, that communication needs to be there, and the records need to follow the kids, and that comes right into education, working with the State Board of Education, getting these kids enrolled in the, in the school districts across the state and having their enrollment information follow them, because oftentimes these kids do not stay uh, in one place very long. So I, I've, got a, I've got a good sense that we're on the right path, but it's going to be slow. Anybody else? So, uh, uh, and this is an open one, you guys just raise your hand on this one. Um, some news a while back that uh, the policy of family separations by the Trump administration resulted in some children being sent here to Kansas. Uh, so the question is, uh, do you all know what the status of that is and, and what 
uh, if anything, can you all do to help get them reunited with their families? So the village in Santa Topeka is, uh, is a shelter uh, for kids, and the village is contracted with the feds because the separation falls underneath or which falls underneath HHS, which is all federally regulated. There's no state regulations to this. The state has no authority over this. Um, I was with a handful of Democratic legislators that went to the villages, toured the facility, talked with the director. At that time, I want to say there were 28 kids in her care, and she had negotiated that contract with the federal government. She'd gone through and applied for everything and made sure all her I's were dotted and T's were crossed. And last I heard, and this has been some time ago, um, so I, I imagine that today that all of the children that were housed in Kansas are reunited with a family member or with the individual that they were separated from at the border, which at the time to me was relieving because I figured that when these kids were being separated, there was no way they could possibly have all the documentation to reunite them. But uh, according to the director of the villages, every child that came into her care came with uh, a contact information either for a family member that would have been eligible to uh, foster or adopt that child um, going forward in the United States or they had contact information for the individual they were removed from um, south of the border and they had all been reunited. So I, I cannot say for certain, but at the time I was relieved with the information I heard. Anybody else got anything to add there? Okay. Um, so uh, a self-proclaimed 10,000 foot question, which whoever wrote that, I really respect your self-awareness. Um, media and water cooler conversations would have uh, us believe that bad government and jammed up legislative processes are a DC phenomenon. Uh, given your descriptions about Topeka, wouldn't you say the GOP leadership's down has flowed both to and from DC? Uh, how, so the question becomes, how do we put effective broad pressure uh, on the KS ledge to do the people's work? Not all at once. So having just a little bit of seniority up here on the panel, I will say that I, I've seen it get better. Um, when I came in and I was elected in 2014, and served my first term in 15, 16, you know, I asked around because we did have this DC style, you know, politics that, you know, if, if that was a democratic idea, it was a bad idea. If that didn't, you know, jive with the governor's wishes, it was a bad idea, it didn't matter, it was just kind of an iron fist ruling, and that came down into the House as well. You know, I watched the Speaker of the House uh, remove uh, Johnson County delegate um, from his chair, both as uh, judicial chair and removed from the Rules Committee because he went against the Speaker's wishes. Um, and you know, that's not, it's, it's, it's within House rules, but it's not very democratic and as far as I was concerned. And then two years ago, uh, we got a different speaker and there was some bipartisan uh, efforts. You know, a Democrat was allowed to carry a bill on the House floor and to carry a bill that means you're the one that literally goes down and presents it to the House um, of Representatives and you're the one who stands for questions and you're the one that makes a motion. Um, and it's, it's kind of an honor. Uh, not every member of the House has done it, not every member gets to do it. There was a member last year, I think, that had been up there for 13 years and had never carried a bill. and. Uh, and, and they were given that honor. And now fast forward that again to this year, and our chairs are carrying gavels again. The last two years, the, our individual chairs didn't carry gavels. Um, the state judiciary had not been allowed to be given in the House chamber underneath the previous speaker. And the last two years, the state of the judiciary, uh, our chief justice was allowed to use the House chamber to come in and give the state of judiciary. Uh, it's my understanding that that was an offer this year, but it was a very limited window on the same day that the governor was given the state of the state. And the, the Chief Justice decided not to uh, dilute either message by having them both in the same day at the same time, so to speak. Um, so so we're, we're seeing a little bit more heavy-handed coming back, but it's still nowhere near what we've seen in the past. And I've actually asked around, and if we um, elect another United States Senator to be our governor, I hope we heed caution from what happened when we did that last time because the cliche is that they're bringing Washington style politics to Topeka. And I honestly believe that's what happened. 
Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's uh, completely different this year than was uh, the last couple of years, uh, all the work we put in to get a Democratic governor elected is paying off big time. Uh, over the last two years, uh, the veto power of the governor was uh, uh, on the Republican side. And now we have really the, uh, the power over the veto at this point as to whether to uh, uh, sustain uh, Laura's vetoes. And uh, we've almost got enough Democrats to do that on our own. And uh, we certainly, we're, I, I have very confidence we can find the uh, uh, two, three, four, five uh, Republican moderates that uh, we can sustain her vetoes. So I think the Republicans are having to deal with a whole new playing field here that all of a sudden uh, they have to worry about vote counts and so on, much more so than they have had in the past couple of years. And uh, so uh, uh, I think that uh, really shows the, uh, the benefits of our work that we did over this last year and over the last election cycle. From, from my perspective, I'll actually draw these two together in that um, it has been a little heavy handed and it is nice having the governor. I, I think that's actually shown up in more heavy handedness. Uh, I was really actually surprised by the reamortization vote um, in the end. The, the, the Republicans were much more united than I thought that they, they would be. And I think they're trying to challenge the governor there to, to, to dare her to do certain things. And so, um, I think they're both correct, but just com in combination, it could lead to the mods um, on certain votes um, combining and being more united than, than we would have in previous years when there wasn't the, the, the backdrop of, of the governor. From my perspective, um, it is a little heavy handed, but it, the, the, the Republican Party and, and the leadership is not all uniform. And so the chair on financial institutions, Jim Kelly, seems pretty reasonable. And he sounded open to me carrying a bill as well. So um, that, that, that was nice to see, and, that, and that's very flattering. We'll see if that happens. We'll see if, if the bill actually show up above the line. But um, that, that, that's been nice to see for me. So a similar uh, question, uh, what are your thoughts on the prospects for Medicaid expansion in the previous session? I think my impression is, is that we have the votes for it. If we can force it onto the floor in, in some way, I think that we have the votes for it between the Democrats and the moderates, and even, even some of the, the rural conservative Republicans. They, they, they need it for their hospitals. I know that our leadership is having ongoing conversations, um, trying trying to work something out to, to get the vote onto the floor, but ultimately, uh, we haven't even had a hearing on it in the House, I don't believe. Uh, we haven't had any uh, House floor debate on it, so it, it, it's no longer a policy game. That's kind of what drives me crazy as a freshman. Is, is, this isn't a policy game. I think people are fairly aligned on this. We at least have the 60 three votes um, to, to, to pass it. It's a politics game to, to force the, the Republican leadership to, to get it for a vote. I agree. <laughs> but I will say, I stood in front of this crowd, or members of this crowd, and said uh, it won't be for lack of effort. We're looking at every quarter. So given the opportunity, we'll certainly put it, uh, put it up for a vote. What can we do? Just keep uh, pressuring uh, the Republican leadership up there to do the right thing and bring this up for a vote on the floor. Uh, two years ago, you know, it passed both the House and the Senate and then went to the governor who said he would not veto it if it passed the House and the Senate. Of course, he immediately vetoed it. And uh, last year, it basically got no luck whatsoever because they were not going to take that chance again. I think there's a couple of things this time that uh, are a little bit different. One, uh, again, it's the veto position that we're in this time. Uh, and the, uh, the second thing is that uh, this, is an, this is an election cycle for the Senate. And uh, the people in the Senate, they don't like it at all, but uh, they know that the, uh, the vast majority of, of Kansans want to see Medicaid expanded in the state of Kansas. So I think politically it's gonna be a lot harder for them to uh, kind of spit the face of Kansans and say, we don't care what you want. We're gonna, we're gonna follow our, uh, uh, again, I think that's a Washington DC agenda more than anything else. And again, I, I think this still reflects um, that uh, uh, the leadership in the, in the House and the Senate does not really uh, uh, represent the, uh, uh, 
the positions of the Republican Party very well. But man, they are good at bullying their own people. And they, uh, it's not lost on, on some of these moderates and so on that it was not the Democrats that took out the majority of the, or the Republican moderates in the last election, it was their own people. And uh, so I think the, uh, the Republican leadership is really good at bullying their own members and uh, trying to keep them in line. But uh, again, with new governor and this being an election cycle, I think that our chances this year of getting Medicaid expansion are much better than they have been uh, certainly last year. In terms of what you can do, uh, contact leadership. Uh, when they accept a speaker or majority leader, minority leader, they're really accepting a mantle of leadership for all Kansans, not just their district. And you send me a letter and you have a District 48 address, I'm hot on that. I, I ride with you. These people need to hear from Kansans that they're being instructionists uh, and uh, in support of our governor uh, and let's do Medicaid this year. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, so the next question is uh, with regard to uh, it, the recent uh, local governments passing NDOs and now we've got uh, I think a bill uh, looking to add uh, protect or adding to the protected class. Uh, anybody want to feel that one? What, what does that look like? Where are we at with that? Yeah, Marie. I am pretty cautiously optimistic on the statewide or adding LGBT um, into the, the uh, statewide non discrimination statute. Um, we got, what, 37, 38 sponsors in the House, co sponsors in the House. That, that's a pretty big number. And we have a, a, a large section of, of the Republican Party saying, you know, I can't really co-sponsor it, but I'm with you if it comes up for a vote. Um, I have, there's 17 co-sponsors in the Senate, which is just four away from, from passing through the Senate, so I'm really optimistic about it. The whole parity marriage bills that, that got introduced two weeks ago or, or whatever, I think actually helps our case quite a bit. Um, you can go to certain people and be like, hey, if you're not with these people, sign on to this bill or help us get this bill passed. I've also heard from, from Representative Woodard, who's been in, in constant uh, conversations with the Kansas Chamber. The Kansas Chamber has actually said, hey, I've been talking to our members, uh, we're not going to oppose it. If you give us a couple days, we might even be able to, to support it. So um, if, if we get to that point, then the chair said that, that he would open it up for a hearing in Fed and State. So I, I'm feeling really cautiously optimistic about this one, actually. Uh, so I think, uh, Representative Benson, if uh, you want, there's a question on what we can actually do to close the bank of KDOT. Do you want to go deeper on what you said earlier? Is there more detail there? Yes, the governor has a plan to uh, close the bank of uh, KDOT within her first term. Uh, I would tell you that's an ambitious plan because of the state balance issue, uh, but uh, she recognizes and has planned uh, to do this. We have uh, testimony indicating how far behind <coughs> we're getting in terms of our road maintenance, and uh, <clears throat> there's really two components of that. There's the cheaper piece that keeps our roads uh, smooth, which is the overlay, where they grind the surface and overlay it. Uh, that is continuing to go along. The problem with that is the subgrades underneath the surface are deteriorating. And once those get to a, a point, uh, you can put the top coat on all you want, that road's going to just break apart uh, almost immediately. So our underlying uh, road work, which is expensive, there's miles and miles that need to be redone. And on top of that, our bridge problem. We have bridge structures in the state that need to be uh, 
attended to. And because of the Bank of KDOT raids, there was a program that previously existed where uh, the state and the county uh, joined together and did uh, county road uh, bridges, bridge projects, because there was a recognition that bridges are so expensive. Well, that was stopped a couple of years ago. And we have uh, made recommendations to start putting money back into that uh, pot to uh, encourage counties to start addressing their county bridge problem. We got into this because of the failed brownback tax experiment where literally he was, uh, as an administration, was looking for money at the end of the year to constitutionally balance uh, the state budget. The legislature, what, the last term we did the, the tax fix? 2017. That turned the corner, but we haven't really made it all the way back yet. And this is going to be a long process. So I don't look for it to, uh, to be an overnight fix, but uh, I think we can uh, be thankful that we have uh, Governor Kelly, who, uh, as I understand it, uh, came with an excellent uh, state finance background to the governor's, <coughs> to the governorship. So uh, uh, she has an understanding of that. Uh, it's going to occur, it will particularly occur if, if she's reelected and has eight years to solve this problem. Uh, but I, I, I see progress being made. I typically don't talk this much, so I apologize for hogging the mic. But uh, my first term, I was on transportation, and we heard from uh, then Secretary King quite a bit. And I sat in for a colleague the other day on transportation and public safety budget for the first time in three years. And it just happened to be the day that the uh, new secretary was in front of the committee and describing some of these problems. And for the first time I learned, not only were we deferring maintenance uh, mileage-wise on all of our roads, which I traveled uh, south in on I-35, and that southbound I-35 left lane is uh, looking pretty rotten, so this heavy winter right now is not going to help a blessed thing. Uh, the snow clouds are hard on asphalt, salt's hard on asphalt, so it's, it's just going to make things worse. But what I learned, were we were uh, short in mileage, but we were also short in our, our overlay. Uh, instead of a three-inch mill, you, they were milling and doing one inch. So some of that stuff that looks good on the surface has lasted through these last couple uh, mild winters, but it's going to crumble this winter. So, and, and again, to uh, kind of back to the Department of Children and Families, they got to get in and they got to see what situation their house is in before they can start deciding where to put their priorities. But I can also say it's refreshing to have leadership in place that's confident, qualified, and caring. And in my years of uh, doing uh, the child welfare work that I've done, I can't name you one, one story that I heard that was a, like, oh, the state did their job and it did it. And uh, Valentine's Day, I got a call from a guy who hadn't seen his kids in two years. He was fed up, he was frustrated, he was mad, he was exhausted. So he was going to DC to try to get somebody there to do something because the agency here at home had wrongfully terminated his parental rights and he was convinced of it, and he was going to do everything he could. He got out to D.C., and Jerry Moran opened his door for him. And Jerry Moran listened to him, and, and, and he said, you know, I'll do what I can to help you. And Jerry uh, called Laura Kelly. And Laura Kelly called the Department of Children and Families. And the guy got his parental rights reinstated two days later and was going to see his kids for the first time in two years. I, leadership makes a difference. Okay, Officer of the Child Advocate. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good interview. Um, I've been working on this idea for oh, over a year now, um, and I had it sent through the Judicial Council. It was written up really, really quick at the end of the last session. It's kind of a combination of our long-term care ombudsman and Missouri law for the Office of the Child Advocate. We got it put together really, really quick, right about this time last year, Got a 10 minute hearing, wasn't well announced. There were not a lot of uh, proponents to come to the committee. 
Uh, it was obvious that the bill had problems. Um, what what is within uh, limitations in Missouri is not necessarily uh, reflected in Kansas. So instead of letting the bill die, I sent it to the judicial council. Um, I don't know how to explain that other than they look at laws and ideas and let you know if it'll conflict with existing laws or or not. So they studied it. I think they had three committees meetings and discussed it, and they came to the conclusion that as written, it was not a good idea, but they didn't expand upon how they could amend, amend it. They didn't look at the concept. They looked at the House bill, and I was absolutely in, in agreement that as written, it had problems. So uh, the task force looked at the concept, and one of the working groups on the task force came up with a lot of supporting strategies for recommendations to the legislature based upon having this Office of the Child Advocate established. Uh, the Secretary of DCF at the time was adamantly opposed to having this independent uh, overview of her department and she said it was uh, duplicative and it was gonna cost her this and they gave it an absorbent fiscal note and she was just adamantly opposed to it. And I reminded the Secretary at the time November 7th is coming, or was it six, November 7th? I said, and, and things are gonna change next year. And she said, I hope not. I said, oh, November 7th is coming. Um, <laughs> so I think I got that in three times in that committee meeting. Uh, but, so she was adamantly opposed to it. She had the committee to vote it down. Um, I knew I was coming back to the legislature. I, the only legislators on that task force were Ty Masterson, Vicki Schmidt, Laura Kelly, uh, Jerry Allensley, um, Linda Gallagher, and Aaron Davis. So it was me and Ty Masterson coming back to the legislature um, and everybody else was moving on or moving up. And so I thought, no big deal, I'll get it in this year. Well, I get in this year and like I said, the department is struggling to put their house in order and they asked for a little bit of time. They, they were not opposed to it. They said they wouldn't oppose to it, but if I give it time, I think I can get them to be a proponent um, and I, I said this to the news the other day, and, I, and I, I hope the public receives it well. I would rather wait the year and get this right than to risk going forward right now and having a bad committee hearing last time, having a task force non-recommendation, having a judicial council non-recommendation, and then having a bad committee hearing this year. So I know a year is a long time to wait. I think this is an extremely important thing. I want to get it right. And if that means postponing it efforts for a year and getting more proponents in line so that next year when we do get the hearing, we can have it go and go well, uh, that's where I'm at. Okay, so as a, uh, a communicator, I really respect that this person is specifically asking this question so they can use it in a social media post. <laughs> um, what are the three main areas that the legislature is most obstructionist? Well, I would say certainly public education, uh, in my opinion, is number one. Of course, maybe because I've been on the education committee for three years now, but uh, uh, I certainly don't see them wanting to uh, initiate any really uh, progressive legislation in that area. And I think we're still going to have to fight for uh, proper funding for school finance and so on. And uh, uh, again, taxation, uh, we're already seeing you know, uh, uh, suggestions that we ought to return to uh, the Brownback policies, which uh, absolutely we cannot let happen, and uh, uh, I think there's still some social programs and so on out there, like Medicaid expansion, that uh, we have not addressed in any way, shape, or form. So, to me, those would be uh, uh, three areas that we really need to focus on, and three of the most important areas to the entire state of Kansas. I would add one from my observation so far, and that would be the issue of state employment and post-employment. Uh, our state uh, trains people, for example, with CDL license. They get their license, boom, they're gone. Uh, and uh, we need to take care of our people better and we need to take care of our capers retirees better. And so I think that our state's employment practices 
have been obstructed to the point of uh, a detriment to government service. Okay, so that's a tough one. So I looked up the Kansas Democratic platform. Number one is fair pay and safe workplaces. Um, number two is strengthening public education. Um, number four is health care for all. Uh, number six is children and family and senior citizens. Uh, ethics and elections. Um, criminal justice reform. Fair, uh, tax fairness and fiscal responsibility. Um, it, it goes on. Equal rights is here. So you pick it, and I think we've covered it. <laughs> yeah, I think to distill it into to just very simply, it would be Medicaid expansion, education, and, and taxation. They, they, they don't want to invest in anything that could potentially help out the poor or, or the needy. Um, and they're, they're, they have their own masters that they serve. <laughs> Uh, so real quick, Jerry, this is a question uh, teed up for you specifically. Um, the enacting housing protections for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and stalking in light of recent news, do you have any uh, updates on, on where that bill sits as of today? I think that's still up in uh, limbo as well. It's certainly a, uh, an issue that, that needs to be addressed in Kansas. Uh, uh, yeah, I think you saw that the uh, uh, Violence Against Women's Act uh, was not reenacted at the national level. I think uh, a lot of the leadership in the, uh, on the Republican side uh, in Topeka still take their, their uh, marching orders from what's going on in, uh, in Washington rather than what's going on in Kansas. And uh, so I think that's going to be an ongoing issue and uh, uh, certainly one that the, the, uh, uh, the Democrats want to address. And uh, we've been very vocal about that, but uh, uh, I think that, that legislation's in limbo and I think it probably will be for a while until we get uh, uh, more Democrats and more moderates on board with that, with that particular uh, legislation. This, this is at best somewhat related, but just a thought that I had. So last week, I think, we had our sexual harassment training at, at the Capitol, which is obviously very important, but the whole time I was sitting there wondering, uh, what's, what's the enforcement mechanism for elected officials? I, I don't know that there is one, but I legitimately don't. I, I don't think it's in the House rules. Um, we don't have bosses other than our constituents, so there's no real enforcement mechanism for it. And there's not a single woman at the State House that I've talked to who has not mentioned harassment in some sort of way. And, and so that could be a potential area to, to, to make a big stink about, and I think it'd be important. That's certainly something that I'll look into and see if we can work it into the House rules potentially eventually, but um, that, that's something to keep in mind. By the way, that was sexual harassment prevention training. <laughs> An important clarification. <laughs> uh, Representative Shu, uh, I know that there's a bill regarding the sales tax exemption for sales of farm products sold at farmers markets. Is there any update on that legislation? Mm, I don't think so. I'm not on taxation. Did I go through taxation? That, that's been brought up, but uh, there's been no action on that yet. Yeah, um, but I know that there will be various amendments um, regarding sales tax on food in general. Um, the, there are a couple varying bills on it. I think there's one that drops to just 1% to 5.5%. There's one that drops it at 3 point something percent. Um, I'm sure Tim Hodge will have amendments to really completely eliminate it as well. Did you want to go ahead and talk about the hemp as well? Yeah, and, and so industrial hemp is going to be really, really important. Um, there were, <laughs> so we have a couple of law enforcement officials on, on the committee, and they are very concerned about the enforcement of the industrial hemp because it looks like marijuana and, and it smells like like marijuana and so they're worried about you know if if they stop a truck you know how do they tell if, if it's marijuana or if it's hemp and personally I, I think that there's a very obvious solution to that problem um, but it, it is a legitimate concern um, the, the KPI the Kansas Bureau of Investigations also brought up the, the, the very good point that it would be fairly expensive for them um, to, to um, 
enforce this as well because right now all they do is what they call a qualitative test. They need to detect THC or they need to not detect THC. But with this one, there, there is a quantitative aspect of it now as well. So the limit for hemp is that the, the THC percentage cannot um, exceed 0.03%, I believe. And so they need to be able to test how much THC, THC is in um, hemp versus everything else. I think uh, cannabis gets up to 18 to 20% THC. So it's, it's, a, it's a really big uh, bar there, but um, the, the, it'll be more expensive for them for the equipment. But it, it is going to be legitimately very good for, for Kansas farmers. And related to the enforcement aspect, um, we already have industrial hemp traveling through Kansas anyways, um, in terms of Missouri or Kentucky or the other states that have already started their industrial hemp program. So that, that's an issue we need to figure out anyways. But um, it gives us far, our farmers one more crop to be able to grow and, and, and um, CBD oil is derived from hemp, and so that's going to help with, with the health aspects as well. Um, and also, I, I do have a bill in the works. It, will, it probably won't get introduced this year, but it is a um, bill to incentivize farmers to implement pro-environmental policies. Um, I, that, that's a big reason why I want it on agriculture personally, is because um, in the absence of there being a water and environment committee like that happened in last previous years, um, agriculture is getting a lot of environmental issues. So I think it's important to, to, to start the conversations on climate change, which is something that I think is sorely under talked about at, 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 at the State House. So that's something that, that, that I've been trying to do. All right, so that's the end of it. I just wanted to say. Uh, yeah, the industrial hemp thing is a really big deal with me because the last two years on the Commerce Committee, I've been working with uh, Representative Willie Dove, and uh, Willie and I could not be further apart on the political spectrum, but uh, we both saw the uh, the advantage of bringing industrial hemp to Kansas, and this is one of the frustrating parts of going through the legislative process up there, is that we had people on the Commerce Committee that, uh, uh, honestly, Pete, I think they thought uh, uh, industrial hemp was a gateway drug to heroin. And uh, it was just really frustrating, the, the lack of, uh, of good information. Uh, Reed hit all the important parts exactly correct. This is a, it could be a great crop for Kansas. It was the number one crop in Kansas for 100 years up until the 1920s. It's perfectly suited for uh, Kansas. They're going to have to build processing plants out there in western Kansas when this really gets going and so on. It's great for rural uh, economic development. But we had a chairperson last year that when they brought in the uh, people who talk about industrial hemp, he brought in the KBI and the Sheriff's Association at the same time. And we also had just heard from an agronomist from Kansas State saying, if you want to kill marijuana, grow hemp right next to, to marijuana plants because they will cross-pollinate and it will kill the marijuana plants. So the science up there is not particularly well thought of, but uh, uh, we try to interject it as much as possible. And uh, this is one thing where actually, the federal government took care of this issue more than the Kansas legislature did. But it's going to be a good, great crop for Kansas. It's going to uh, really help in economic development. And uh, uh, stay tuned to see where we go with this. OK, so that wraps it up for the Q&A session. You guys have any final statements you all would like to make? I can make one more obstruction statement. Uh, <laughs> The elections committee the other day, not only did they not expand voters' rights to allow your vote to be counted uh, up to election day, if you were an eligible registered voter, but then they went a step further and they said that um, ballots, uh, you may no longer collect ballots uh, for anybody unless they ask, and, and it would be a class nine felony if you were caught with anybody's ballots. So what this means is legal limit voters can no longer go into a retirement home and say we're here with mail-in ballots or, or you know ballots period uh, fill them out get them filled out and we'll take them to the election office for you now each individual would have to come up to you and request it otherwise you would be subject to a class nine phone uh, so that was interesting and then uh, ethics uh, had requested our ethics commission had requested for electronic filing for every state office uh, currently for every statewide office it has to be electronically filed, but now for any state office, so this means every House member, every Senate member would have to file electronically, which 
sounds fair if you have access to the internet, which the entire state of Kansas doesn't. The, uh, I know that I've talked to several House members that don't have uh, internet access to their residents. You know, so then it, it draws a question, do you then go to a public library and are you allowed to use a public library and public internet access to file a campaign report? Because I can't use my state laptop to do my campaign finances. So, but the, the committee, they voted on that yesterday. Um, I'm sure it passed out. I haven't verified that, but I'm sure it passed out a committee yesterday. So not only are they not increasing uh, voters' rights, but they're restricting the candidate pool and uh, increasing penalties for people trying to get out and help people participate in it. Furthermore, on Children and Seniors Thursday was a banner day. Um, KDHE had come in and asked for uh, legislative permission to assess a, a, a fee for people that are running a home-based child care facility and refusing to be licensed or regulated by the state. They currently have the authority to assess a fee up to $500 for anybody that is licensed but out of compliance. So if you've got kids in your home, but you've got too many kids for your home to be capacity for because the fire marshal has said you're, you can watch this many kids for this many square feet, but they don't have the ability to, to assess the fee for somebody who's refusing to get licensed. That then is a civil penalty goes to our district courts. District courts are backed up, our judicial system's underpaying. This, uh, this bill came to us with KDHG as a proponent and one written opponent, and no neutral and no opponents. And the Committee on Children and Seniors became the opponent on this. They said that you are inviting government into people's personal residence and the fire marshal has no business in there and you have no business uh, forcing people to get licensed when they're merely watching their neighbor's kids, which KDHG explained. If you are watching any child for less than 20 hours a week, or if it's un, uh, unregular, this this falls specifically for illegal action, and, and that's defined in rules and regulations, of which I'm running to the grocery store, will you watch my kids for a half hour, um, doesn't, doesn't fall under. And so the committee tabled that bill on Thursday. I'm hopeful that we can get that one back off the table and get it to KDHE to help, uh, help KDHE help provide safe uh, environments for kids outside of their outside of their home or their residence home. So, just just another uh, mention of obstruction. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you each of you very much for being here, our state representatives. And just especially thank you all of you for making out in a gloomy day and, and being here to, to hear from your representatives in our state government. Thanks very much.